Welcome to another episode of the Bobcast. This week we begin with track and field. Head coach Dale Louie and coach a the Bobcat Invitational began on Saturday and really the only home event for track and field this whole season. A slew of winners on the men's side, on the women's side. Uh, the sprinters had quite a, a bit of success. Uh, what was it like to stay home for the weekend? And really, the weather turned out fine. The turnout from other schools was solid. You know, how did the whole meet as far as a day run? And, and what's really your role when it comes to, you know, a home track and field event? It, it's a lot of work to put on. There's, you know, there's no doubt about that. Uh, you know, a lot of days of preparation, you know, for that. A lot of equipment moving. Uh, you know, this year was a little, <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit more challenging because some of the construction going on down there and a little bit touch and go with some things. Uh, you know, we had a little bit of a brief electrical problem uh, before the meet starts, but you know, everything worked out well. And uh, like you said, the weather was great, and, and we, uh, you know, we typically do not have that. You know, so uh, everybody was jan dancing with joy over, you know, over that aspect there. Uh, and then the meet itself is, you know, it's uh, you're not doing a whole lot of coaching because uh, you're just trying to make sure that that meet is running well. And and uh, you know, kudos to the coaches on the staff and and you know all the maintenance individuals involved with uh you know helping us put that on because it's it's uh it's uh, definitely a, a team effort to to get get a meet set up and run you know run well we're, we're starting to get into the outside season starting to get some good weather for practice and for meets itself and, and we've talked about this you, you kind of get limited chances where it's not too hot it's not you know rainy dreary whatever how did your team and your athletes kind of take this opportunity and, and really what did you see um, in terms of results from your athletes who competed? Yeah, uh, pretty optimum conditions, just like you said. Uh, you know, not uh, wind was, was not a factor either. Uh, and uh, I, I think you can see uh, in our results that in, in a number of different areas, uh, in fact, probably in every event area, you know, we had some really nice performances on, on the men's and women's side. Uh, and, and the weather's part of that. The competition was part of that. Uh, being at home is part of that. Uh, you know, the the athletes appreciate that, and and uh, you know, friends come on out and watch them, and and uh, it's uh, you know, you're sleeping in your own bed, so to speak. You know, there's a lot of positives to to being at home. Unfortunately, in the nature of our sport and our facility, it's you know, it's 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 not something we can do very often. So uh, they really do appreciate it when we. Uh, when we do put on a meet. The women's team, uh, Maddie Watson winning in the 200 and 400, Gabrielle Reason winning the 100, Holly Van Wee winning the hammer throw, resetting her own school record. Uh, what did what were the highlights on the women's side? Uh, it seemed as the, the sprinters really took charge in this meet. Um, you know, we've been talking about this all year, cross country, indoor track, outdoor track, the numbers, the injuries with the women, uh, with the women who competed. What What did you see on Saturday? Well, we, we're definitely getting there. Uh, you know, as, as you know, Gabby and, and Kenzie Smith were not part of the mix here a couple of weeks ago, and, and they're still not, uh, you know, totally healthy, I guess we could say. Uh, they're working w their way back. Uh, they continue to do rehab, and and uh, but we're happy with the progress that they're making. Uh, they're, of course, excited about the fact that they can actually, in their words, you know, do something. Uh, so... Uh, that's very positive for us. Uh, we're hoping here, uh, moving forward, that we can get four by one team going again. Uh, we think we can put together, you know, a pretty good four by one team uh, if we can get these women all, you know, healthy and able to work together. Uh, Holly had a great day out there. Uh, what uh, the person who got over, a little overlooked uh, on Saturday was Kirsten Tony out there because, uh, you know, Holly, uh, you know, Holly had a really good throw, a school record throw, and. Uh, it wasn't all that long ago that what Kirsten threw would have been our school record. So she really, uh, she's all along has shown the ability to throw far and, uh, you know, has slowly worked her way. But Saturday for her was a, was a big breakthrough. And uh, to have those two women, you know, at that level there uh, is, is, is really nice. You know, it should hopefully to carry that through into the conference championships and they'll be highly competitive. Sure. Uh, I want to shift over to the men's side. 11 total victories for the Bobcats. Uh, Clayton Washington winning the 200 and 400. Shamar, a two-time winner. Shamar Nelson, the 100, the long jump. Uh, you'll have to help me. Is it Ritez? Yes. Ritez McLaurin? Yes. Uh, winning the triple. Robbie Romano, the 800. Matt Whitley, the 5,000. And then the throws. John Kearns, shot put and hammer. Michael Belcher in the discus. James Nail in the javelin. 
Uh, top to bottom, it seemed to be a really, you know, all around complete performance from your team. Uh, would you say that that was accurate from the men on Saturday? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, those technical events, this is where there's a real advantage, I think, of being at home. You know, you're, you're, you're practicing in that circle or on that runway uh, on a, a nearly daily basis. Uh, and, and every runway and every, every surface is, is a little bit different. So you're a little used to that. And, uh, you know, through the years, you know, that's kind of shown up. Uh, uh, now our runway has been a little different story. Uh, you know, we've not been able to get on that very much because of construction and the turf field and everything. Uh, so, you know, not quite as much familiarity there, uh, but a little bit, you know, and, and uh, I, I'm sure that it probably helped the jumpers uh, a little bit in that regard. Uh, so, uh, you know, a, a good day, you know, all the way around a lot of different events. Uh, I want to touch on the men's side that the top 50, you know, the outdoor performance list is, you know, update current with the Saturday and Sunday results. And on the men's side, you've got five individuals from Frostburg, one relay that's in the top 50 right now, you know, to, to be there in nationals, you need to be, you know, top 10 to 20 to be in that conversation. Uh, Romano in the 800 and 1500. Shamar in the long drum, Belcher in the discus, Kearns in the hammer, Nail in the javelin. You know, we saw this a little bit in indoor track where Frostburg was in the picture nationally. Is it a boost for your guys to, to be up on these on these results? And do you think you can get more more focus and practice and, and meets because of, you know, hey, we're, we're in this and this really is our last chance here at the Division Three level to, to, to make a run at this? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. I mean, they're very cognizant of that. Uh, you know, they know what they need to do to, to, to reach the national level. They know it is not easy at all. Uh, you know, there's no, you know, you can be conference champion and not make nationals, you know, as, as we've had those situations. Sure. Uh, you know, it's, it's different than, than those team sports and things. Uh, you, you know, truly, you know, our people are competing against every single, you know, in the case of male or female athlete on, in their gender, uh, in, their, in their sport. So mm -hmm. uh, to get there in itself is... Is, is quite an accomplishment and it, it is a factor uh, in terms of driving people. We've got the all Atlantic region thing that has some pretty tough standards and that tends to be the first, the, the first uh, goal there that, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, shoot for uh, and we've gotten, you know, a lot of people there uh, ready to roll there. Uh, and then that next level, as you mentioned, is, is, is nationals. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's great for a program that, you know, keeps sniffing at that, you know, Nationals, there's, you know, it can be disappointment. You know, last year our women's teams, our relay teams were, were close, you know, in, in both indoors and outdoors. And it becomes a little disappointing as for any athletes if, if you don't make it. But uh, as, as you well know, I mean, our, our track and field program, uh, you know, throughout the history of Frostburg is, is about going to the national meet. Yep. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's in some ways very disappointing in, in, from the standpoint that, uh, you know, I think sometimes uh, our athletes in our sport, it's like ho hum. Oh, you're at nationals again, and uh, you know it's it's like any other sport. I mean, you you got to work for it, and and if you work for it and you get it, you 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 probably deserved it, you know. And mm -hmm. and uh, that's that's a, certainly a motivating factor. And and uh, weather's been cooperating with us, you know, which has been very very helpful. And uh, hopefully that will continue to be the case. And we've got some good competition in front of us. Uh, uh, you know, our competition really starts to ramp up here now week after week. And uh, the bottom line then is, you know, on the athlete side, you know, be mentally prepared and physically prepared and the competition will be there. And then it just let it roll. Let it roll. I want to touch on two kind of groups here within the performance list. Uh, three throwers on the outdoor performance list in three different events. Belcher in the discus, Kearns in the hammer, nail in the javelin. How has that throwing group kind of come along? You've got some experience there uh, in it. What what can you say about this outdoor throwing unit and, and how, especially at the top, it's performed so far in the season? Yeah. We, we, I think, anticipated that we would be a, a little more of a force uh, outdoors and indoors. Uh, you know, A, there's obviously more throwing events, uh, but s uh, some of those throwing events, you know, we knew that we, we had ability, you know, in those areas. And uh, uh, that group is working really good. Uh, uh, we uh, have the opportunity to, I think, score some good points at the conference championship. Uh, 
but again, you know, you got to show up and do it on that day. So that will be the challenge. Uh, I think the fact that uh, they're out there a little bit competing against each other, you know, every day. They they know what their teammates uh, are doing. Uh, I think we have uh, across the board uh, a number of athletes on our team, not just in the throwing areas, that you know are supportive of each other and and push each other. And then finally here with the national performance list, the men's 4x400, four first time, you know, ran ran here for the Bobcats in the Bobcat Invitational. Uh, Frostburg wasn't really able to get an indoor 4x400 four four outside of that first meet of the season. Uh, who was on the 4x4 four four squad this past Saturday, and, and what what is your view of the potential of, of that group uh, moving forward? Well, we, we had uh, Clay Washington, uh, uh running a really great anchor leg there. Uh, I was out at the throws, so I, I didn't see it, but I heard about it <laughs> uh, from uh, not only our athletes, but uh, some of the other coaches uh, were also uh, talking to me about that relay team. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had Clay uh, out there. We had Jake Rickards, who's you know a distance guy uh, out there uh, you know, running uh, with that particular group. We, we really uh, – we have a – uh, a lot of flexibility yeah. with that four by four. Uh, I mean, Robbie Romano could theoretically hop in there. I mean, we've, we've actually uh, run him. Uh, well, we've run a distance four by four that uh, I think for a bit had probably the fastest four by four time we had so far. Mm-hmm. So uh, we, we're not sure yet what our A team is there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, Saturday uh, we can say is our A team because they, they ran the best time to date. Sure. Uh, but we've had some other people, who have run some splits that, that could have uh, run faster splits than some of the people we had Saturday. Uh, so it's, it's, I won't even call it a problem. It's, it's nice to have that option. It's nice to go to the conference championship knowing that if somebody's not feeling well or somebody's gassed after two days of competition that you, know, you can reach to, you know, in our case probably, we can reach to probably about, you know, three or four different alternates and I don't know that we're going to miss a beat there. It, it, it's exciting. It's one of the most exciting events, too, to watch uh, as well. So we're going to keep tabs on that uh, throughout the rest of the season. And Coming up for Frostburg Track and Field, uh, Messiah this weekend, I believe it's scheduled Thursday through Saturday. Yeah, Thursday, uh, the multi-events decathlon start. Brad Forrester will be uh, in that for his fourth year, and, and we're hoping for some big things there. He's gotten better, you know, every year there, and uh, – uh, he's definitely shown improvement in a number of events, you know, individual events uh, that will be part of the decathlon. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, on Friday afternoon, Brad will be finishing up, and our men's discus throwers will be throwing. Uh, and then on Saturday, it's 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 everybody else. Uh, so rather long day, uh, pretty big meet, uh, definitely some good competition in in all of the events. And uh, so that's. As I said earlier, you know, one of these meets we're looking forward to to help continue to pull our people along to some good performances. We're fired up for that. So a successful Bobcat Invitational this past Saturday, FSU at Messiah this coming weekend. Coach Dale Louie, thank you for joining me on the Bobcast. Thank you very much. Next in the Bobcast, we have men's lacrosse with head coach Steve Gardelman. The Bobcats dropped a pair of games last week, a, a heartbreaker in overtime to Randolph-Macon on just a wild last-second shot and then a loss to number one Salisbury. 21 to 6. Uh, the Bobcats still 7 and 4, 0 and 1 in conference play. And Coach, you touched on this after the Salisbury game. A game like that against a, a high powered opponent, kind of a lopsided score, can really turn guys against one another. And it didn't on Saturday. This has been really a, a rough stretch for this team. And, and it was designed to be that way. You know, E Town, Randolph Macon, Salisbury, York CNU. Going into the year, this was going to be the toughest stretch of the season. Uh, what's, what's really the perspective of the team? where it is right now after going through some adversity in, in the last two games and, and, as you said, kind of sticking together through this adversity. The guy's just ready to get back to work. Um, you know, they're, they're excited for their next opportunity, and we've always been preaching from the start how much this is a process and we have to just work through everything. And this is where we want to see kind of how far we've come in, I think, the you know, almost four months now that I've gotten to work with the squad, which is still a fairly short amount of time. Where, where are we in? Um, every year we go together, we're going to try and put a schedule similar to this that has national contenders all the way through. Hopefully not all in a row, but if, we, if it happens, we'll take them because it'll really show kind of our character and, and what we're made of. So we're ready for these, um, whatever they might be. It's still 
any get anybody's um, chance on any given day. You got to go out there and make sure we make a few plays. And I think it's going to come from playing with a little bit more speed of play, a little more intensity at practice, matching what what the conference play is like in game experience, which is um, you know no dud ill statement to anybody else we've played before, but conference play is a whole different whole different intensity. So uh, we got to start bringing that to practice as much as uh, as much as we can, and that should translate. I want to start with Randolph making it. It kind of sticks out as one of the lower scoring games that Frostburg has played really offensively and defensively. What what really contributed to that? I think it's uh, two strong defenses. I think our defense played lights out that game. We really put a lot of emphasis on that side of the ball in practice and uh, trying to tune up some things that, that we saw in the E-Town game. And those those guys really almost 180 from the E-Town game to that game of, of just tightening everything up, playing with communication, playing with discipline, and playing with intensity with without you know fouling too often. We did a really good job in that game of just doing what we want to do on the defense end, imposing our will and kind of having some control in a reactionary position, having some control on the defensive side. Um, and the offensive side was kind of the same. They dictated us a little bit. We weren't able to spin the ball as much as we normally like to. We didn't get as many assisted opportunities as we try to create. Um, and the fifth face-off game was out 50-50. So um, I think it was just two strong defenses in our offense didn't quite have that flow and, and, and tempo that we were looking for. The Randolph-Macon game was is a lot like some of the other really competitive games. Uh, Eastern, Widener kind of stands out in my not mind where more or less there, there's even numbers across the board. Frostburg, a slight edge in most numbers outside of, of really ground balls. In, in games like that, what ultimately decides those games? And and uh, really sometimes you're on the, <laughs> the wrong end of a tough break, and, and how does your team kind of handle that? Yeah, sometimes it's bounces. Sometimes it's uh, you know a call that maybe you don't agree with, or or something that goes that way. Maybe somebody comes up with an injury, and you know we have to play a little bit deeper. So all those things play into those tight games. It's never one event really that happens, but you can see all those things factoring in in some ways. Um, you know, I really think that those those games are are made for for us. Those games are made for you know how we got to be there in those moments, and how we have to you know train those killer instinct moments. And that's what I think those games are really good for us. And I'm hoping that these games coming up will be more of those tight competitive games where we can use some of the things that we learned in those tight games and finding that killer instinct or that discipline or whatever it might be in those moments to be first to the ball, be first to the line, be first here, just having that instinctual first decision to go get the ball, go chase a shot, whatever it's going to be to confidently pull a shot on offense, anything in between that, but just having that killer instinct and decisiveness in those crunch time moments when, when some people may freeze, we want to be going. And the, those out-of-conference games give give your team a chance to prepare for those in-conference moments when they do come. Mm -hmm. I want to jump to Saturday against Salisbury. It, it's a top-flight team. Salisbury came out fast, eight goals in the first quarter, really controlled the game from the face-off spot. Their top face-off guy, 19 of 22 for the game. H how hard is it to win a game when you don't consistently have the ball? And and how did Salisbury really challenge you at the X? And, and what adjustments did you – and I saw you you're trying a whole bunch of different things. H how did they make life difficult you – for you there uh, their wing play was really good really sound um, we're gonna we're gonna emphasize what we do there and have a little more of a schematic up there instead of you know just the will and hustle that we, our guys are giving us we want to coordinate that a little bit more because their wing play was really tuned up um, and and kind of like what we talked about a second ago they were first to the ball they were first to pick up everything um, and they're really like you said really sound really high caliber team and uh, you got to tip the cap to the guys they came and they played um, but I think I think we still have a little more to, to tap into and I think it's going to be that decisiveness, that, that schematics that gives them some confidence to be in the right spot, to be first to the ball where it seems like the balls bounce Salisbury's way sometimes. And I just think more or less that's balance and you know that decisiveness to run and go get it. So we're working towards that, and that's when we've been preaching for the past couple weeks, championship caliber lacrosse. That was an image of, yeah, obviously, that's a championship caliber team. Let's practice that way. Let's train to be in that game, and then we'll know that we're championship caliber as well. There were some aspects or some moments where, where we saw some of that. You know, they come in with the number one scoring defense in the country, number one defense in the country. Frostburg, six goals in that game, which is above their scoring average. Uh, two goals in the man up. How, how, once Frostburg had chances offensively, was the offense able to succeed on Saturday? Yeah, when we, when we were clicking well, it was, it was stuff that we scouted, some of the things that they like to do, and, and our offense kind of plays well into some of those things. We had to tweak a few. Um, so I really like the way our guys were able to adjust in a two-day turnaround to tweak our offense just a little bit. And when we got those opportunities, it seemed like we were running it really well, really clean, and and uh, shooting some decent shots. I think I think we could have tried this this guy a little bit on some different spots as shot selection on the net. Um, but overall, I think the offense was beating some matchups pretty clean. Um, I'd like to see us work a little bit more 
um, in the pick game because I think the pick game could have been beneficial for us and some things we talked about. But realistically, small adjustments for them to draw Jason slides and, and shoot good shots. Yeah, two from Clinton, two from Rupert. A, a really nice end-to-end -end goal off a of CT and uh, a clear. That was great. Um, what can you carry over just from the experience of playing that team that's first to the ball, ready to play from the beginning, sharp at the face-off X, uh, especially heading into a matchup with York in which Frostburg's been very competitive over the last few years? It's going to be something that we have to learn where they did things you know, quite uniquely and, and try to do things our way, but in that body of work, in that, in that you know, championship caliber and that, that kind of mindset of how we want to build our program and how we want to be each and every day. So seeing Salisbury was a good eye-opening experience of that CAC, you know, championship, championship caliber ball. And York is right there with Salisbury in the same kind of essence of maybe, uh, you know, not quite the scores that, that Salisbury puts up in every day, but definitely the talent and the, and, the, and the execution that they have on their side. So it's another thing that we say, that's what it looks like. Now we're not going to be surprised by it. We can practice, train, visualize, and hopefully come out with a better effort on Wednesday. This week, York and seeing you. Uh, York last year was an 8-6 game in the regular season here, 6-5 uh, in 2017, 8-4 in 2016. Frostburg won in 2015, 11-7. All those games tend to be low scoring and close. Is that style, is that something that's conducive to your team? It can be, absolutely. It can be. In the Randolph-Macon game, you know, I think we were right there and uh, you know, one or two bounces our way, one or two shot selections our way um, could, really, could really change that game. Um, I, I think that's that's fine with us. We talk about being multiple, and uh, we've won a couple of those tight, close games, and we've lost a, one or two of those tight, close games. So we've seen both sides, and they're all learning experiences, and I think I think that's something we could absolutely pull off. But honestly, um, you know, I feel it's a ball control style game that York's going to play and you know manipulate some of the things he do with their faceoff X. So if we can step up what we're doing at the wing play to help out our faceoff guys, keep winning the ball, I think we might be able to see. Um, Hopefully, eleven touch the scoreboard on our end and and stretch that 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 goal differential a little bit, or at least the goal total. We'll, we'll see what what things are happening out there. Well, we're fired up. York at York on Wednesday. Seeing you at our place on Saturday. Uh, Coach Steve Gardelman, conference play rolls on. Thank you for joining me once again. Thanks for having us. Next in the Bobcast, we have women's lacrosse with head coach Haley Weir. Uh, the Bobcats winners over St. Vincent College, sixteen to two on a Tuesday game, falling to Salisbury in the CAC opener. Salisbury top five in the country coach we'll start with st vincent uh it's a midweek a tuesday road game kind of out of the normal routine your team comes out and scores three times in the first minute and never really looks back uh were you proud of how your team was really ready to play at least from the very beginning and then execute early and establish a lead i think that it was really important for us to start that on the right page we had said that that we want to come out of the gate strong and sometimes our team has had trouble this year where we um, if we have a lead, we've lost it, or if we dig ourselves a hole, we can't climb out. And so this was a game where we really set the tone and said that we wanted to stay up by a good amount the entire game, no matter what happened. So I feel like it was a total team win. Um, everyone got in and everyone got some time, and I think everyone worked together pretty well. So that was exciting on our end. Yeah, a game where your team opened that big lead and got offensive contributions really from all over. Uh, I want to talk about some of your first years. Chloe Johnson gets three goals in the second half. Bridget Weiss having two goals. Kelly Claxton getting in with a pair of assists. Uh, how can a game like that build confidence, especially in, in your first-year players? Well, Chloe, for example, she's been out with an injury, and so she's only been back for one or two games. And so we've been trying to find a role for her that kind of fits in, and we had wanted to move her to midfield early on in the – season before she got injured and then had decided after that we just wouldn't have enough time to do that so we had to keep her as a defender but going in this game I kind of gave her an opportunity to say do you want to try to play some midfield she takes the took the draw for her club team um, back when she played and so I wanted to get her some reps and see if we could try that and plus it gave Summer a break which was nice so she said she was all for it so we put her in had her take the draw I think that went really well and then to get down on the attacking end she really just had that drive she was really one of the only people that I felt like was constantly driving in and being a threat even though those options and looks we had said kind of take the right one and make sure that you make a count but she was still driving in and being a threat all over the field so um, we told her to continue to do what she was doing and so she put three points up on the board and it was huge um, same thing with Kelly and Bridget and Shelby did well on the draw like we moved people around a lot and kind of gave them some opportunities to see how we could build confidence and how we could kind of get a little bit more comfortable in some different positions and I think they took full advantage of it. 
think it's interesting in, in games where, where you're either up by, by a lot in St. Vincent or, or down to a great team like Salisbury. Um, you mentioned about Johnson and driving to the net. How important are good habits even in later in those games, in running clock situations, and, and where have you seen that or, or not seen that from your squad you know, this year or, or this past week? The little things are the big things, and we talk about that constantly. This whole past week we had said we're past the point now going into season where we will give you anything new. It doesn't. You don't need new plays. You don't need new defense. You don't need a new ride. All of that stuff has been set. It takes care of the little things, throwing and catching and being able to execute things that we've talked about over and over, 50-50 balls, draw controls, anything that makes a game. And so we have tried to talk about working smarter instead of harder, and we literally harp on that every day at practice and so I think some of those little things that like Chloe with the driving I mean that's something that we harp on it a lot but if you don't have it in you you don't have it in you and so to see Chloe that be so natural for her even though she hasn't been in games I mean that was huge and then for her again to do it in Salisbury like that was even more it just shows what kind of player she really can be and I think we're excited that now that she's back from injury that we really have some time with her to grow. You mentioned you're past the point of installing new stuff, and it's really just refining at this point. What would you say of your team's you know, overall package? What's the strength of the team, and what really needs to continue to be refined uh, at this point in the year? Mm, I think that refined is we need to decide that we are invested when we're there. I think sometimes um, games either – if they're not going our way, sometimes mentally take us out of it. And I think that we need to be a little bit more on top of it and understanding that we can do it and make a big impact. Um, and I think that sometimes when we are really smart about decisions and it is just so pretty to watch, those are our strengths. Like we just don't do them enough. So in Salisbury, when – um, the ball movement was so fast, and we got that pass to Morgan, and she shot it, and it went in. I mean, that that whole play was just so pretty with the ball movement. And we work on that stuff at practice a lot, and then sometimes when we get in games, I think it's just we're so tired that we can't execute stuff. And so I think really when we are smart, it's a huge strength of ours, and we need to use it more often than not um, because it really does help us in our direction of where we're trying to go. I do want to touch on that Salisbury game. You mentioned it there, one of the goals, uh, Morgan Cavey scoring it. FSU is a stretch where it puts together a couple of goals conse consecutively in that first half. Both goals were after Salisbury had won the draw control, and Frostburg had a save, successful clear, a goal. Frostburg, you know, lost the draw control, battled, got the ball back, cleared, and scored. Um, what did you see in those sequences that really, you know, was a glimpse of your team's potential and something that you want to see on a more consistent basis? I think it was just always looking up and working together. They, there was always an next pass. And so that first one where Abby saved it, or second one, I forget which the order was, but where Abby saved it, and then it was a successful clear, and then it was another pass in midfield, and then up to another, and then it literally moved around on attack to, like, six different people, and then finally it went in the back of the net. Like, that just shows how much teamwork really is and how much – yes, we're tired, but we can all come together and make our jobs easier instead of having one person constantly run the ball from one end to the other who's exhausted. Um, so I think that some of those glimpses there, it shows really, like every time we do it, we're like, it is that easy. Like, and they are so happy and so proud of themselves when they do it. And it just, I wish that they had that consecutively and could really step up. And I think the hard part is that they pick and choose kind of who shows up on what games. Sometimes there's two people on and then the next game those two are off and we have two more on and then the same thing happens and so we're just never all on at the same time and I think that's the struggle and I think that's what's hard with having a small team is that there's not a lot of options and so whether you're on or not you're out there and so we've tried to say that of like you don't know the impact that you have on this team and how much you're really valued and how much you're needed and I think that sometimes we try to go by the wayside and say like today's just not my day and someone else will pick it up for us and I think that when we all work on the same page it really does show the potential of this team I mean they are so talented it's just we haven't put it all together yet we got into this when we were talking with men's lacrosse here today as well uh, playing Salisbury opening the season getting into conference play experiencing it um, is that kind of a, a wake-up call in terms of intensity of hey what we need to do when it comes to practice needs to really reflect what we're going to see in the games. Yes, absolutely. We had said the same thing. Our out-of-conference season didn't go 
how we wanted it to go. And so we had tried to say like, hey, just a heads up, that was the easy part of our season. Like we're now getting into where there's four teams that are top 25. And so we we really have to pick up the intensity of practice because what we practice is how we play. And I think that until they saw that yesterday, I'm not sure if it really clicked – or on Saturday, I'm not sure if it really clicked in yet or not of the faster pace that the games are and the more talented players and the more of them that they have. I think that really that was a wake-up call to say maybe we really do need to play a little bit smarter and try to conserve more energy because we don't, we can't match up with them right now. And I think we – started talking a lot about what would be good wins for us like what would be considered we're playing the number four team in the country yes the score might not go exactly how we want it to but what would we consider to be a win and so I think that some of those things that we had said we didn't achieve and so moving forward that's something that we're really going to talk about this week is okay let's same thing with York I mean they're coming up and they're another they're top Number eight. Eight. Yes. So I think that's another thing of, okay, now what's another win for us? And like really holding them to those accountabilities that I think is going to make a big difference because it is the little things sometimes that are the big things, like we said earlier. And I think that if they can really find something that they're proud of when they walk off that field, that's just going to fuel the fire for moving forward the rest of the season. And then moving into next year, we basically have the same team. So I think there are little things and I think that we can be successful if we put them into action. Yeah, finally, this week, York is here on Wednesday. Frostburg travels down to Virginia to take on CNU on Saturday. Uh, What are you looking for out of your team uh, over the course of this week? Um, I think just what we said, the little goals, I think that this is a tough week. I mean, Salisbury, York, CNU, that's a a hard week. And so we had said that, and I think that really making sure that the little goals that we need um, to meet and we set for ourselves and making sure that practice is more intense the entire time, I think that's going to make a big difference. Um, So we'll set our little goals for each game, and we'll see if we achieve them. And I think if we can, that's going to be a success for us. Well, thank you very much. Women's Lacrosse back at it this week. York on Wednesday, seeing you on Saturday. Head Coach Haley Weir, thank you for joining me once again. Thanks, Andy. Next on the Bobcast, we have tennis with Head Coach Jeff Splinter. Both the men's and women's women's tennis tangled with Christopher Newport and Salisbury over the weekend. Seeing you, of course, nationally ranked on both sides in terms of tennis. And on Saturday against Christopher Newport, the center tennis court was dedicated. The Lonnie D. Athey center court. Uh, there was a ceremony before the Christopher Newport match, and uh, from what I hear, a good turnout. What what was it like to have the, the dedication, and what, was it a little bit of a boost for the athletes to have a, a turnout there for Saturday's matchup with Christopher Newport? Yeah, absolutely. It was, it was a lot of fun. Um, we got to see a lot of past tennis players here from Frostburg, a couple of the previous coaches that have uh, either coached Lonnie or been a part of his life while he was here, so... Um, it was it was special to see all the players and and the families come come for that and to hear about previous experience that was here at Frostburg and what Frostburg tennis has has been because of Lonnie where it, where it kind of started and you know where we're branching out now because of because of his efforts and you know his care to his athletes uh, and something that I definitely took as a coach that I would love to take a part of my my coaching career is you know the special bond that he had with his athletes you know that reaches beyond tennis that reaches beyond academics and um yeah it was great it was great to hear from his previous player from his from his wife and then also um you know for our players to be a part of that was special um and you know seeing the kind of dedication that previous generations of Frostburg athletes had was was great look to carry on uh, the the tradition of Frostburg State Tennis on a, mm-hmm. the brand new uh, complex with the center court named now after uh, coach Athey what did you see from your team uh, against Christopher Newport and really let's start here seeing you both sides is ranked in tennis what what is your team's mindset or approach when you're taking on a, a ranked opponent um, and also how was, was there a little bit of a challenge in balancing you know, getting up to play a ranked team and also having the dedication and, and just the turnout there uh, to not, not get too excited and expend a lot of energy early on. What, what was it like to take on a ranked opponent and also manage the dedication as well? Yeah, it was a, it was a long, busy day. Um, we'll start there. But uh, I thought our players came in um, after dedication. We went straight into the warm-up and just got straight into business. Um, 
the men's team and the women's team have a very structured warm up to where, you know, we're we're 100% focused. We're looking. We know exactly what we're doing at any given time. We know we have to finish by a quarter two so that we can start doing some uh, some team things and have our team talk before before the match. And you know, the message we gave was the same on Saturday and Sunday. It's the same it's been against Mary Washington. It's the same it's been against every conference opponent, St. Mary's. It's taking taking the match one point at a time and playing our best tennis. Uh, and we feel we played our best tennis this weekend. Uh, might not have shown on the scorecards exactly, but the effort and the energy was 100% there. And, you know, our athletes are, are super pumped to be Frostburg Bobcats and to compete in, in the CAC conference. Did, did you see the the energy of the dedication and the turnout really translate onto the court in that effort and energy and, and anything really stand out in particular against Christopher Newport on Saturday? Yeah, absolutely. I thought the crowd this weekend was phenomenal. We had probably our biggest turnout on Saturday, which was awesome. We had some of the alumni come back and watch after, after their luncheon. Um, but it was fantastic to kind of get the support from previous – previous players here and alumni and also a lot of parents came out this weekend uh it was a fantastic weekend 65 degrees beautiful day um so you know we had a couple of people that got a little bit sunburnt but you know we're gonna get through that um yeah the energy was was awesome i thought in doubles when we first started um you know shasta nate Derek, jeff justin chad all came out doubles really strong um and we're playing points the way we want to play points on the women's side, we actually had a little bit better results in terms of actual games for doubles. Uh, and Sammy and Shea at second doubles have been playing extremely well together. They they complement each other extremely well. Um, and then you know they're putting overheads away at the net. They're they're both crazy with volleys and love love moving at the net and being being present and then just staying really consistent from the baseline. I want to go over to Sunday's matchup with Salisbury. Uh, a couple of interesting storylines in this one, a battle at number one singles on the men's side for uh, Shasta against the top player for the goals. Uh, Kate Paylor wel being welcomed back after injury. She slips in at number two singles and really bumps everyone else down into a little bit more manageable matchups. Uh, what, what did you see you know, against Salisbury, especially in terms of, of Shasta's play and then Kate Paylor's impact on the women's team? Yeah, I thought Shasta came out extremely focused. Um, the first set was was extremely close. It was a back and forth battle the entire way. It was started. He started off a break at three two, um, gave it back to four three, and then it was back forth, back and forth the whole way. It got to five all, and then uh, Seagulls number one guy Colt um, won the last two games. Uh, one really close in Deuce and a lot of. A lot of deuce add points, but um, I was really impressed by how he was able to tackle each point individually and had a game plan of exactly what he wanted to do against him. And, you know, moving forward, I mean, I think we might be seeing Salisbury again, maybe in the playoffs. So to kind of get a, a good result like that kind of gives a little bit of confidence, um, especially knowing that he's one of the best players in the conference um, to – to hold his own, you know, I think knowing that he can compete with this guy, he knows that going into Penn State Harrisburg, going into York, mm -hmm. that he has a really good shot against anybody in this conference. And, and Kate, then Kate Paylor for the women's team. Yeah, Kate um, wanted to give singles a try. She's been she's been injured this whole year, but we've been working her in the in the strength room. We've been working her in the AT room. She's extremely dedicated to to getting back on the court and, you know, wants to be out there. She's a gamer. She'll, she'll go through whatever it takes. Um, yeah. And she, she slotted in there at number two singles, which brought everyone down a slot. Um, and really because of that, saw a lot of, saw a lot more energy from our players, you know, being a spot down, being somewhere where they have a better chance of winning um, really makes this team deeper and, and scarier moving into, more winnable conference matches with uh, Penn State, Harrisburg, and New York. 
Yeah, and really, I want to jump to that. Penn State Harrisburg on Saturday, this coming Saturday. Last year, a 5 4 loss for the men, a 7 2 win for the women. This this is a big match for Frostburg State Tennis and Capital Athletic Conference play. What's the preparation like this week, and um, what are you looking for out of your teams this Saturday in terms of, of just energy and excitement in, in a big matchup that the women won last year and the men lost uh, in a very close one? Yeah, we're just looking forward to it. Um, you know, we're we're the quote unquote underdogs going into this match. So, uh, you know, the CAC decided to vote us eighth in both the men and women's poll. So, our women have already proved that different by beating St. Mary's, mm -hmm. and you know they want to keep climbing up the rankings and beat Penn State Harrisburg too. Um, this way, you know, had the conference playoffs been the way they were last year, we would have made it either way um, with the top six. And that's something that's been the goal of women the whole entire season is trying to compete against the teams that we can beat and playing our best tennis against the teams that we can't. And, you know, so far I feel we are playing our best tennis and, you know, playing our best tennis moving into the most competitive match of the conference is going to be – it's going to be a fun battle on Saturday for the women. We're excited. Uh, Penn State Harrisburg, always a big one here for tennis – a one that the women won last year, men looking to take here this year. Uh, mm -hmm. The weather's gotten better. Oh, yeah. Uh, we're fired up for it. Tennis back on the road this week, and really we're, we're winding down to the very end of the tennis season. So head coach Jeff Splinter, thank you for joining me once again on the Bobcast. All right, thank you. Next on the Bobcast, we have softball with head coach Bill Vasco. And Frostburg State softball started conference play last week, beating Southern Virginia twice on Wednesday and got a chance to play the number one team in the nation at Christopher Newport on Saturday. Uh, two wins over SVU, two losses over CNU, a, a tight game in game one against CNU. But we'll start against Southern Virginia, you know, really the CAC opener for your team. Speaking in generally, what, what did you like from your team's performance in that doubleheader sweep of uh, Southern Virginia? Um, you know, the biggest thing was that, uh, you know, we haven't got to play at home a lot and to open up conference play at home and come out with two quality wins, I thought we played well in all aspects of the game uh, in both games and, you know, was able to uh, come away and get a great start in conference play. So, you know, I, I just think just that the kids came out and, and played really well at home in the conference openers and in all aspects of the game was the biggest part that I was proud of. Game one, Frostburg, you know, jumps out, a run in the first, adds a run in the third, a run in the fifth. It's 3 nothing. Southern Virginia battles back with a, a big two-run triple. That tying runs on third base. Caitlin Merling works out of the inning. At, right after that, the bats come out and get two runs to extend the lead. Um, were you happy to see kind of the urgency that your team played with once Southern Virginia really got back into the game? Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, we've talked a lot about how, you know, we can't relax as a team. But one of the things that I think we've done really well all year long is when another team scores, it seems like a, a lot of the times we come right back in and score and answer, which I think is big. You know, you talk about trying to win every inning. But, uh, you know, to be able to keep battling back anytime another team puts pressure on you is great to see, and I'm glad that we were able to do that. The way that game ended, we talked about it a little bit before, you know, we got to this interview. Sam Carver, a big catch really right near the, the le wall in the left field uh, corner. You know, Frostburg has spent a lot of time in the gym. How was she really prepared for that moment defensively and, and to make a big play there at the end of the game? Yeah, we haven't had a lot of time to practice outside, but... You know, uh, after our first home series, you know, we had a little bit of issue with uh, the sun. Um, and, you know, I told our outfielders we were going to get some extra reps in so that we could make sure that, uh, you know, the sun and, you know, being out in our outfield was going to be an advantage for us and a disadvantage for our opponent. And it definitely paid off because it, it you know, affected one of their outfielders that uh, helped us out a little bit. And then for Sam to go back and get a good read on that ball and get back and find the fence and battle the sun and everything and make the catch to close out the game, that was really key. Big catch and a big win for Frostburg to open up the season. We'll jump to game two against Southern Virginia. SVU throws its second pitcher in the first inning, and really the Bobcats jumped all over, 5 nothing lead after the first. Uh, really with the switch in the doubleheader from one pitcher to the other, how was your team able to, to really be successful early on uh, against a different arm? Um, you know, 
I, you know, looking at the stats for Southern Virginia, we knew that the pitcher that threw the first game had had a tendency to walk a lot of batters, and we wanted to be really patient. And then with the second pitcher, we thought she was going to be a little bit more over the plate. Her velocity was a little bit lower. So, you know, we made an adjustment there really quickly to be able to go and uh, get some hits and runs off of her and knock her out of the game. And then, you know, I think that puts pressure on their other pitcher to come back in and try to, to battle back in a game where she's down and she's already thrown one game. And, uh, you know, we kept that rolling a little bit. Uh, you know, it was nice to jump on their pitcher and then keep it going against the other pitcher once she came back in. In game two, Frostburg was able to grab another run in the next three innings. And you're sitting there up 8 nothing after four, three outs away from a run rule situation. And Southern Virginia gets a run in the, f- in the fifth, adds more in the sixth. Did you get the sense that your team kind of was able to relax with the lead and then, boom, Southern Virginia's kind of back in the game? Is that is that something your squad can afford to do, and is that a chance to learn? Yeah, I think that's something we've talked ab- a lot about uh, with this group is that we can't relax at any point, that we need to keep putting pressure on teams. And when we get an opportunity like that, we want to put them away. And, you know, I felt like we were, we were right there to finish it out, and then they squeaked that one run in, and it was kind of like, okay, now, you know can we battle back and get that one run and it's it's always seemed like you know when our team gets up our offense especially kind of relaxes a little bit and we've talked about that that we can't be in that situation that you know that if our pitching and and defense can't always stand up the entire game at least you know our offense is kind of what we've gone to um, needs to keep putting pressure on teams throughout the entire time and put it away you know so you know, it's it's one thing to be at eight to nothing and want to finish it out there and give up a run. You, you know that happens, and but not being able to bounce back on offense and kind of finish the job. You know that's something we would have liked to have done, but you know we hung in there and finished it off and got the win and it completed the sweep in the the conference opener and that was really great. Yeah, n- nice to get that experience and still come out with a victory. Uh, for me, finally getting to see softball at home, it, it really has struck me in the Salem series and the Southern Virginia series. Uh, you know, the Bobcats are extremely aggressive on the base paths, and there are even some instances where you, you catch both sides of it where you, you get an extra base and you score, and then, you know, a runner's caught stealing the play before a home run, a runner's thrown out, leading off an inning, stretching a single into a double, and then right after that there's an extra base hit. Uh, what's the line for this team with the aggressive base running, or is that just, you know, this is our identity and, and it should be second nature for us to, to be and look to, to push these situations? Yeah, that, it's definitely something that uh, we're stressing in everything that we do in when we play and, and in practice. And we talked a little bit uh, in practice after that game because I thought our base running got a little bit sloppy there where, you know, I'm, I'm never going to be upset if we get thrown out on things when we're being aggressive and really pushing the envelope a little bit. But if we hesitate, which I felt there were a couple of times where we hesitated and then tried to take an extra base and then we get thrown out, that's where I'm going to be a little bit more upset. Like if if we're going all out, we get good turns and we're aggressive and we put pressure on the defense, which is what we want to do. Um, because in those situations, when you're you're getting big turns and you're trying to take that extra base, that's when you put pressure on the defense, especially the outfielders, to be able to come up cleanly with the ball and make a good throw. Um, I'll never be upset if we get thrown out in those situations, and we're going to keep continue to steal bases. And, and you know, as long as we get good jumps, I'm fine with that. But if we don't get good jumps, if we don't get good turns, if we hesitate at bases and then get thrown out, you know, that's what I talked to the team a little bit about, that we're not slowing up on that part, but we need to be crisper on everything that we do, make good decisions, and, and you know, not have that hesitation at any point. Let's just go all out and keep putting the pressure on the defense. So um, we're, we're going to keep doing that every opportunity that we get. It's a fun style of play. Uh, yes. to watch uh, for sure. Finally, we'll move on to uh, to Christopher Newport. Uh, 3 nothing and 8 nothing wins for the captains. You know, seeing you the number one team in the country. You know, Really a strange start to game one. You know, Hamlin doubles. Ford looks to score. Uh, it's ruled that Ford doesn't touch home plate. The The next ball in play is a double play and seeing you's out of the inning. You know, how how did that sequence really change the game for your team and, and how, how do you respond to, to something like that happening? Uh, you know, it's disappointing to, to have a run taken off the board when you think that you jump out and you gain a little bit of momentum. I don't, you know, ultimately, how did it impact the game? I'm not really sure. I, I didn't think that it affected um, our play or, you know, our emotion or anything like that. You know, I, I felt like we were up the entire game and, and kept, you know, putting pressure on them. And, 
you know, they got were able to get key hits to put a couple of runs on the board, and, you know, we didn't answer. We had runners on the entire day, and we, yep. we just didn't capitalize on anything when we had the chance offensively. So in that first game, you know, it's disappointing to jump out and think that you're taking an early lead, but at the same time, I was proud of the kids that it, they didn't let that phase them. Um, you know, and I felt like there were some calls throughout the game that kind of went against us, but our kids kept battling, and I, I felt we were super competitive and we were right there and had the opportunities. We just didn't get the hits when we needed them. Game one especially, two of the biggest areas, you know, when we've talked for this team that were question marks, pitching and defense in high leverage situations. You know, Frostburg doesn't come in there. Seeing you as three runs, all of them, you know, scored with two outs. Was this the kind of performance that you – you knew that your team had in its potential and you hope to see consistently, at least from a pitching and fielding standpoint. Yeah, we talked about after the games that, uh, you know, I thought we hit the ball well both games. We played great de defense in both games. We only had one error on the day. Our pitchers did what we asked them to. Um, I, you know, I felt like in the second game we got squeezed a little bit, but our pitchers came in and, you know, limited the walks and, and did everything that we asked them to. And, you know, I felt like, you know, that first game, you know, you go toe to toe with the number one team in the country and feel like that you have an opportunity to keep competing. And I told our kids, you know, I hope we see them again at the end of the year in conference play because I think we can beat them. So, you know, especially if we play like that in game one, and, you know, like I said, if we get a little more opportunities to pick up base runners when we have them in scoring position, uh, you know, we'll be able to do that. But, uh, you know, overall, you know, it's disappointing to lose two games, especially two conference games. And um, But at the same time, you know, you feel good about how you competed, especially in that first game. Finally, I want to touch on a couple of juniors, Caitlin Merling and, and Claire Hanlon, that had nice weeks last week. Uh, Merling, the, the winning pitcher against Southern Virginia, you know, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Christopher Newport in game two. Hanlon, the big doubleheader against Salem, driving and runs in both games. She walked a couple times against Southern Virginia, had a pair of doubles uh, in game one against CNU. As kind of the upperclassmen on this team, how, how, how has their play really taken the lead here um, once we have gotten to conference play? And, and do you kind of expect that out of upperclassmen? Yeah, I think uh, Caitlin on the mound has uh, continued to um, get better every opportunity that she goes out. Um, you know, I, one of the things that, you know, I think you, that stands out, especially when she's pitching in the first game, you're obviously going against the other team's number one as well. So it's crucial that, uh, you know, she has a great performance out there because you know that your runs or run opportunities are going to be a little bit more limited where, you know, she was starting a lot in game two earlier in the year. And, you know, and then we head into conference play and I wanted her to go up against the other team's number one. So, you know, she stepped up and done that and that's been really great. Um, I thought Claire got a, off to a little bit of a slow start at the beginning of the season and she's really picked it up at as of late. Like if you go through and look at uh, what she's done st st statistically uh, over the last 10 games or so, you know, she's really picked up the pace and it's been really good between her and Olivia. You know, when Olivia gets on base, Claire's able to do some different things to get on base or drive her in or move Olivia up. And if Olivia doesn't get on, then Claire's able to come in and, and find a way to get on base and give us that same opportunity to continue to set the table for the rest of our order. Yep, good to see you out of the juniors. Finally, this week at Hood on Tuesday, hosting Mary Washington on Saturday, hosting Salisbury on Sunday. Busy week for the Bobcats. What are you looking for out of your team? Um, the big thing is, you know, um, take one game at a time and, you know, bounce back tomorrow against hood is is really crucial um you know i i told our team that you know we have again we have a great opportunity to get on the road and go against the team that i feel like we should be able to go out and pick up two wins against but at the same time you know we don't want to underestimate anybody on our schedule let's go out uh tomorrow and play at one pitch at a time and play our best ball and and do what we can to compete and come come out of there on the positive side of things tomorrow and, and worry about the weekend after tomorrow well, we're fired up to finally get Fro Frostburg State softball here. Uh, <laughs> it's been fun uh, to get to see him this past week. So, Bobcats at Hood on Tuesday, Mary Washington Saturday, Salisbury here on Sunday. Coach Bill, ba Bill Vasco, thank you for joining me once again. All right. Thank you, sir.